Welcome to another episode of Life Distilled. I'm Kobe Williamson, founder of Microshiner, and I'm here at Better Root Cider and Fire Root Distillery with Jesse and Hannah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming for down. Me. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I really like the spot you guys got here. You got a great view of the sapphires and yeah. bitter roots and nice little uh, location here. And then, thanks. Yeah, kind of see what the bitter roots all about by looking out the windows here. <laughs> it's good. So you all started out making cider, mm -hmm. um, a little uh, change up from what we usually check out uh, with our with our spirits. But we'll get to that. What do you have? What do you got? Let's try it. So we have three different ciders um, that we've bottled. We've done like a bunch of different batches, um, you know, tried to see what people were interested in and um, what we were interested in. And so we started with um, a Macintosh uh, cider. We call it I cider. Um, it's uh, Macintosh and Goodland blend, all uh, Montana apples, um, all bitterroot apples. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also have, oh, do you want to talk a little about it? Well, it's just, that's been a local favorite, I guess. The, the Macintosh apple is, uh, has a really big history for the Bitterroot Valley. Right. And um, there's still like 100 year old trees that produce apples and we've actually gotten some of those apples that make a really good cider. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a really good local cider that we produce. And then you can talk about the other ones. Yeah, so then uh, we also have uh, what we call a rooted. It's a semi-dry traditional um, using uh, English bitter sharp and bittersweet apples. Um, those are actually apples from the bitter root as well. We we're excited to find those. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's, it's a higher alcohol one just because, uh, just 8% because of those um, English style apples, those cider specific apples, you know, have higher sugars, higher tannins. Um, so this one ended up being uh, pretty unique. Um, and then we also have um, our hop cider, we call Hope. Um, it's also in that semi dry range um, and it's dry hopped with Citra and Cascade. And this is using um, winter banana and Jonathan apples. Winter banana is kind of that. A, a weird heirloom apple um, that we ended up finding and uh, I don't know it was kind of a cool apple to work with mm -hmm. fermented um, with like a really ripe banana um, nose yeah the aroma um, during fermentation yeah. was amazing yeah, oh, wow. yeah it was yeah. cool um, but that kind of mellowed out um, so it's not like banana um, but uh, yeah it's like citrusy um, and um, uh, yeah, apple, like uh, uh, grapefruit, and yeah, so. You want to try it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Would love to. Oh, There's do you want to? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasure. <Thanks. laughs> so, some time ago, I watched this program, I think it was on Nova, and it was about how the premise of it was that are these plants actually using us or are we using the plants um, and it was they used uh, cannabis mm -hmm. tomatoes and then apples to kind of discuss the possibility that it's not really us using these plants to, to further ourselves but yeah. plants using us to further themselves around the entire country and the yeah. world you know huh. and one cheers. thing that they had cheers <laughs> cheers cheers Jesse thanks for having me yeah. Oh yeah, I like that. I like, uh, the thing about cider for me is it has to be dry, you know, mm -hmm. and there was so many in the very beginning with ciders, you know, they just came out with these really sweet, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause I think they just took apple juice and poured some <laughs> grain alcohol in it, or <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. some malt yeah. alcohol in it in order to make the, you know, the mainstream ciders that you first started to see in commodity yeah. ciders out around the shelf. Uh, but now this is, a uh, now, this is the kind of craft cider that I could get into. <laughs> nice. But when, uh, on this show, when they got talking about the apples, what I found, and it made me think of it when you were talking about the English apples, was that most apples are horrible. Mm -hmm. like you can't eat them. Mm -hmm. And then to propagate the apples, you had to take one apple tree that was good and then make rootstock off of there and graft that onto something else and then propagate that specific tree, mm -hmm. yep. you know, forever and ever. And that they had said when they first were bringing apples over to America, 
you know, they would plant the seeds and grow these apple trees up, but half the time, or actually more like 80% of the time, they were no good. And that's why they made a lot of cider because yeah. they could make cider. <laughs> Can you eat the, uh, the apple? You wouldn't want to. No. Right? Yeah, they're it, is, it is that <laughs> bitter. Yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah. bitter. And, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, you bite into it. Yeah. It's a lot of, we use a lot of crab apples. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and some, yeah, some of the other English and mm-hmm. French varieties you, you bite into. And there's a lot of, flavor there mm-hmm. right and and it's really sweet mm-hmm. but it's not something you would really enjoy yeah, eating the whole yeah. apple that like whole drying and like bitterness on your tongue <laughs> yeah it can be yeah. it's overwhelming yeah, it, is, yeah. <laughs> right. it makes great cider yep. yep you mentioned the long history of the bitter and and the apples um it's exciting to start to see some cideries in the valley and i think there's three maybe mm-hmm. now that are yep. operating in the valley yep. because as you said um and I don't know how familiar, you guys are probably more familiar than I, but, you know, that was what developed the area in the first place besides Marcus Daly and, the, and all the logging that he, they were doing for timbers for the mines, but that these guys came out and thought they could speculate on creating <laughs> orchard tracks and have people come from out east. And, yeah. yeah. And it actually produced really great apples from my understanding, but... Totally, yeah. We were, like, in competition with Yakima, Washington for a while. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> Back in, like, the early 1900s. So, yeah. yeah. But then drought of high water prices and then the railroad going through washington instead of through here is kind of what shut that down yeah the bitter is definitely at a disadvantage for a lot of uh, agricultural products just because you know we're that one way in one way out valley mm-hmm. right. that's off the spur of everything <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah. it's even uh, with tourism makes that a little bit harder because it's yeah just a little bit out of the way mm-hmm. but it is it's, it's well worth place. coming down here. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to tell too many people, right. but at the same time, a few more would be nice. Uh-huh. Yeah. Especially if they come and then go and right. leave a little money. Yeah, you know, totally. Take some cider. <laughs> yeah. That would work out great. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me how you guys got into cidery. I mean, you guys are relatively young. This place is new. Obviously, it's something you just kind of recently got into. Mm-hmm. So how did that come about? Like, who were you before and how'd you arrive here? Yeah. Um, so, well, I guess... Um, craft alcohol is something that I've always been interested in and um, we've been interested Mm -hmm. in. Yeah, we like, before we even met, we would homebrew and dabbled in cider making Mm -hmm. and wine making. Mm -hmm. And and then when we started dating as well, we we lived in Missoula and had an apple tree in our backyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't have the best eating apples, Mm -hmm. but we rented a press and started making cider with that. And that was Mm -hmm. kind of the beginning of cider. And our cider always turned out way better than our beer or our wine. <laughs> so it was kind of, you know, uh, it was more natural for us to go that direction. Mm-hmm. And, um, but we, when we were in Missoula, we uh, started running a video production company. Mm-hmm. And we ran that, well, we're still kind of running that on the mm-hmm. side. Um, and that started, let's see, eight years ago? Um, yeah. Yeah, probably about that. Yeah. Uh, and then it kind of uh, branched off into manufacturing camera equipment because we specialize in filming aerial cinematography with drones. And yeah. at the time, that technology was brand new in the U.S. Right. And there was no type of stabilization system. So I, en- I have invented a stabilizer that you could mount under a drone. And uh, we started manufacturing it. Hannah convinced me to... <laughs> That or c- convinced us that that was the next step, you know, is to actually. Well, we wanted to that. share that with other people, you, you know, bet. not just us, um, you know, reap the benefits, but like have other people, yeah. you know, have more stable footage and um, other small filmmakers to be able to use that. Yeah, so. right. It allowed a one man crew to have, you know, very cinematic mm-hmm. footage. And um, yeah, so we. We did a Kickstarter and kind of took that to market, mm-hmm. and we've been selling those gimbals for five years now. Mm-hmm. And, but during that process, um, sorry, that's that's the backstory. <laughs> kind of leads us into. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how I tell stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be here for a while. <laughs> yeah, leads us into the cider operation because we really wanted to be local and sustainable. Mm-hmm. And with manufacturing the camera equipment, we are sourcing parts from literally all over the world. Right. And, and it's super competitive. I mean, the tech industry, it's just, yeah. you gotta be thinking 10 steps ahead and, mm-hmm. and always um, just progressing that technology. So 
then we went back to our cider and we were like, you know, cider has been made for thousands of years Mm -hmm. and the process changes and like the product changes, but, um, it's the principles are pretty much the same. It's been around for so long. And, and then we moved down here as well and Mm -hmm. started learning about the history of the Bitterroot Valley Mm -hmm. and, um, all those things kind of just came together and we realized that cider was the direction we wanted to go Mm -hmm. Uh, more long term. And, you know, we keep running our other business and we planted the orchard, uh, a couple years ago and planting an orchard, you know, is, is long term. Like (laughs) some of our trees won't produce, they've been in the ground for two years, but it'll probably be another five Uh, years until we even see apples from them. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a long term goal with that. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you can jump in. Oh. Well, I got to applaud you guys oh. on that because it's a personal theme of mine that I rail against uh, sort of the American mindset because, as you said, when you're dealing with trees in particular, we're talking about 100-year life cycles, 300-year life cycles. And the mentality in America is how, many, how much money am I going to make this quarter? Right. And then I'm going to reassess what I got to do for that next quarter to do something. And so going out and laying down, you know, 300 saplings or, or grafts into the ground and, and going, okay, in five <laughs> years. Yeah. I also feel this way. It, it's really when I first decided that I had an interest at all in spirits. Um, because as a young person, you know, you got into some trouble with a bottle of peppermint schnapps. It was <laughs> yeah. horrible to drink anyways. Right. Had some mouthwash and then you felt terrible for <laughs> two weeks. Um, but then I came across the scotch and I just was reading the label of a bottle of the Balvenie and it said, you know, seven Scotsmen made this 12 years ago wow. is in essence what it said. And I just yeah. thought the forethought to take a barrel mm-hmm. and set it aside for 12 years. I didn't know anyone in my entire life uh, up to that point who would do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. The people I knew, they would try to grow some reefer and before <laughs> it even like had flowers on it, they'd cut it all down and yeah. it was gone. And, and yeah. so those are the kind of people I had been associated with up to that point. And so I applaud you guys for going out there and putting trees in the ground. I mean, whether you're here or not, they're going to be here a yeah. hundred years from now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we all need to do more of that, I think. So kudos yeah. to you guys. Thanks. <laughs> So it's life distilled. Mm-hmm. You're making cider. All of a sudden, you're thinking, "I need to make some spirits as well." Or did that come first? Or how did that all play together? I know. Um, just a little aside. Up at Swanson's Orchard, their son, uh, one of the first people I had gone to check out when I got into craft mm-hmm. spirits, he had bought a little still because he was just looking for ways, when they had excess apples, what to do with them yeah. because yeah. they had had this bounty crop one time, and. They sold all they could, and then they sold the rest of all they could to the applesauce people, and they still had apples. Wow. Mm-hmm. And they just had to let them go, basically. Oh, wow. oh, man. And so he had gone into all the different orchards around the country, kind of researching. Not He didn't go to all the orchards, obviously, but he went around. But he, And what he found in the Northeast was almost everybody also had a still and was making brandy mm-hmm. from their apples. And so he had a little brandy still, and then he decided he didn't want to do that, so he got out of it. But... Um, I could imagine that if you had cider, you might just be like, well, I might as well make, uh, <laughs> make some, some spirits as well. But how did you guys yeah. come to it? Yeah, well, I mean, it was kind of a toss-up at the when we first got into it. We knew we wanted to do uh, craft alcohol, and it was kind of like cider or spirits, which, which should, should we do? And so... Um, we decided to start with cider, um, do, you know, our, our, get our base solid, you know, cause that's the base product of, mm-hmm. of what spirits we wanted to do. Um, and so we started with cider. It's easier to get into as far as like equipment and, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, as far as stigma for the legalities, mm-hmm. it was easier. Um, and so, yeah, we started with that, but then. I guess it was a year later we decided to actually go for it um, with the spirits with our, as well. Yeah, our distillery mm-hmm. license. Yep. Yep. So I'm, in my mind, the reason that you guys would have done that is because you can create a cash flow business off of the cidery. Like the distillery side, unless you're in a larger urban area where you can actually sell cocktails out of your tasting room and bottles mm-hmm. to a reasonable audience, it's really hard to cash flow a distillery because 
the upfront fixed costs are really high to get the still, to get the licensing, all that kind of stuff. Why you see so many breweries in the world and like tomorrow I might go out and start one is because I can make some beer, I can sell pints out the front door and I could probably cash flow all my overhead and most of my fixed costs right out the gate. And a lot, as almost any distiller will tell you, I mean, that's pretty much not the game, especially if you're aging your stuff. So yeah. mm-hmm. when, uh, when I first had heard you guys were doing this and that you had moved into the spirits, uh, I assumed that was kind of the idea, but you were saying that you're actually not even going to try to do, um, tastings yeah. and things as part of your revenue from out of here? Um, yep. We're only going to be doing, um, like monthly tastings and tours in the summers, um, you know, it's, it's just the two of us and it's a lot of work. I mean, but be, between running, you know, manufacturing and then the orchard and then also, um, running a tasting room, it's a lot of work yeah. and you know, our location isn't perfect for mm-hmm. having, you know, people come every day or even like realistically every week, mm-hmm. you know, we're, so, we're a block off the highway, yeah. which isn't that far, but yeah. it's just far enough. Yeah. To, that it makes it harder to kind of lure people. And we're not in road. like, you know, a town center. Right. We're kind of halfway between Florence and Stevensville. And, you know, we didn't want to be in a town center. We wanted to work at the same place that we live, essentially. Yeah. So that was a part of our, you know, our goals, our personal goals. Right. Was to have like a bike ride commute or a walk <laughs> commute, yeah. you know, but still like live somewhere where we could have an orchard mm-hmm. yeah. so. and close to recreation. Yep. Exactly. Being in the bitter roots. Yeah. 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 So, so it's a, it's a great location for a manufacturing facility. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot lower cost here than if we were in Missoula mm-hmm. or even just crossing that County line. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, for running a taste, a daily tasting room, it makes it a little bit trickier mm-hmm. location. So yeah, with the distillery, we've set up the business model, uh, all with distribution mm-hmm. and, um, I don't know if we'll be able to sustain ourselves just in Montana. That's the goal. It'd be awesome if we can just distribute throughout the state and uh, keep it relatively small and within our state. But we are, you know, we may try to distribute to some other states as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads me, uh, it's skipping ahead a little bit, at least in my, my outline, but it leads me to kind of where my next question is, is that's always something that I am really interested in speaking with distillers about when I get in touch with them and uh, sit down with folks. Because I'm of the mind that you have to actually set that goal for what your scale is going to be before mm-hmm. you get into it so that you can understand whether or not you can cover the amortization of those fixed costs because starting up a distillery costs a whole bunch of money, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, re- relatively to doing a brewery or even doing a cidery. Not so much like you guys are doing it because you're doing it right from the apples. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people buy you know, the, um, the juice and then they make their cider that way. But to do it you know, from, from uh, field to, to bottle is... It takes a little bit more. So, but I always like to, to talk about, you know, what, what you plan to do with your scale and whether or not that was something that when you looked at the market that you thought you could capture, if that's how you designed your business. Yeah. And I found most of the successful ones really thought about that on the front end. Yeah. And they said, okay, if I can just win vodka in a one bar in every town in Montana, mm-hmm. will that cover me? Yes, it will. I'm going to start this thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Did that cover the, the costs and, and my overhead and paying my folks? And um, so that's, that's good to hear. You know, I think yeah. that's super important in this space because one thing that I don't think everybody thinks about when they jump into um, craft spirits in particular, but even starting to be wine and cider and beer as well is there's 1500 craft distilleries, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Before there was 12 right. distilleries yeah. covering everybody. Yeah. <laughs> But that just means, you know, and there aren't more drinkers. That's something else people yeah. don't quite understand about the spirit space. You, you, could, you could maybe create more people that want to go paddle boarding. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not going to get any more drinkers into this system because yeah. that number stayed static for 30 years. Yeah. Right? And it, it's probably static for longer than that if you really look at it. And so it's just always a, an interesting part of the conversation. Because there's 1,500 of them, that just means less and less. And how... How do you win those folks from Jim Beam over to Kraft? Because I think mm-hmm. that's where the whole game is. And, yep, totally. And kind of setting yourself up for success within that context is a big part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And along those lines too, most most distilleries that we see popping up follow you know a very similar type of business model that kind of has been proven to some extent with 
you start with your vodka and gin because you can get those out right away and then you start aging your whiskey and then yeah you know a couple years you can start selling that and actually start making some money and we're not two people that really follow <laughs> you know the path that everyone goes down and you know starting up the cidery there's there's really no market data with cider not sales in Montana, in, in Montana <laughs> yeah which it yeah. would be great if there's more information like that yeah, yeah. but um with spirits there is more information mm -hmm. right. available because it's state regulated so yeah. that's great and that's how we can kind of design our mm -hmm. model but we also yeah we didn't want to follow that model of vodka gin mm -hmm. so like our vodka we do plan on releasing a vodka um because we personally use vodka in a lot of cocktails yeah, yeah. But it's going to be further down the road and maybe like later this year. Yeah. But we have two brandies that we really want to release first. And, um, and they're young aged. And, uh, and then we're doing a coffee brandy liqueur as well, which we've been um, experimenting with that recipe for a long time. But that's going to be one of our first products as well. Mm -hmm. There's just been a lot of excitement around it. And yeah. um, I think it's, it's fun also just starting with products that... It, brandy sales aren't huge in the state, but I think, you know, with the cider movement and um, when people taste our spirits, you know, I think it's going to hopefully turn some heads and yeah. get more people interested in that. Our yeah. first product that we're going to release also is um, called Apple Jill. Um, so it's a 20%, uh, so 40 proof. Um, so it's on that, in that liqueur range. Right. Um, and it's a uh, fresh cider and apple brandy. So, um, nice. kind of like a, uh, I don't know, just like easy drinker. I, and I feel like along those lines of like, you know, turning some heads, that name, Apple Jill, I don't know. It's just kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, we need more of that. I can make this, uh, pretty serious. And I think a lot of people do like, Oh, one thing that I get into conversations with the sellers about you. I don't want anybody to think that we don't want to be associated with moonshine. I don't want anybody to think that I'm a hack. You know, I, I want everybody to think that I'm top shelf and I'm a you know, you know, premium whiskey. Uh, I think there's some room for some fun in craft yeah. spirits oh, as yeah. well, Actually. and a little frivolity, <laughs> so and yeah. make some fun of ourselves every once in a while, yeah. and, and not take it quite so serious. Totally. Yeah. Uh, kind of got ahead of ourselves, so let's Sorry. let's step back a little bit. No, no, it was me mostly. Um, I had kind of thought that, as you had said, that since you guys were doing spirits, that you would be doing brandy, which meant you needed to age it and it would take a little while, mm -hmm. and that you were going to use the cider kind of as your vodka to sort of underwrite that making of the spirits. Mm -hmm. But then you brought up making a vodka, which I think is, uh, are you you're going to do wheat on that? or how, nope. how do you guys plan? You're all apple? All in on apple? Yeah. Um, our plan initially, and we aren't. I wouldn't say we're set in stone on keeping everything apple-based, but our plan with our first five products, they're all going to be apple-based, 100% just made from apples. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the coffee brandy, obviously it's going to be blended with a coffee, but the um, brandy that's used as the base spirit for that is made from apples. And the vodka is going to be made 100% from apples. So everything is um, gluten-free. Mm -hmm. With the vodka, we're still um, in discussions with the uh, government yeah, TTV. <laughs> about having that gluten-free. They don't believe it's gluten-free. Yeah, even though the only <laughs> ingredients are apples. It's really funny that we needed to submit um, a sample to a lab um, to test for gluten-free. Yeah. And we're like, it's, it's apples. How could <laughs> right. there be gluten? Yeah. But, um, not many people do uh, apple vodka. So, yeah. you know, it's right. just something that's uh, different to the government and they yeah, want to make sure that everything's legit mm -hmm. but um yeah so that's going to be really exciting and because it is a vodka it's you know it has to be well it has to come off the still at 190 proof right and so technically flavorless and odorless but mm -hmm. because we are using apples we want a little bit of the apple to come through right uh, our battle right now is that too much apple is coming through there's it's too much like a brandy mm -hmm. and if you mix that in a cocktail then um there's a little little more apple than we want so we just have to keep running it through the still until we hit that point where we're satisfied with our vodka yeah well you talked about the vodka you talked about the brandy and the coffee liqueur a little bit can you just run through again what all you guys are planning on making as far as the yeah. spirits do you want to start 
Um, yeah, so we're going to do an apple jack, um, which is, uh, again, just that 100% apple brandy, but it's um, uh, aged for uh, about two months um, on oak, mm -hmm. so young aged. And then apple jill, which is the apple brandy with fresh cider, also lightly aged on oak. So those two are going to be the probably the first two, yeah. and um, there's also... A difference in proof so apple jack is is 80 proof right and apple jill is 40 proof got it um and, um, and then we're going to be doing um, um, the uh, coffee brandy um, so liqueur um, which we're calling buzz um, and uh, so that's actually we're working with Hunter Bay. Okay. Um, yeah, just down the road, right. ten minutes, which is kind of fun. And yeah. our, our one of our climbing buddies is actually the head roaster, so we were really excited about that. Yeah, um, that's been a really fun collaborative yeah, experience because yeah. mm -hmm. we've we've gone down there and uh, sampled a bunch of different coffees and talked to them about what we think is going to blend well with brandy mm -hmm. um, and then kind of gone back and forth and we've we've run a bunch of different trials there's a handful you can <laughs> see on the table down yeah. there yeah that um, and the coffee makes a big difference but also the process of mm -hmm. how oh, really? uh, how we're blending it mm -hmm. with the brandy or if we use the brandy and actually do a cold brew with a, yeah. a certain percentage of brandy yeah, it extracts like this, yeah go ahead sorry. oh it, it extracts uh, the coffee a little bit differently mm -hmm. right so yeah, just trialing that has been, it's been a super fun process and it's been drawing on for months. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're trying to get it just right, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, I think that's sort of the uh, upside and downside of craft distilling right. is that you can kind of go into a rabbit hole mm -hmm. uh, exactly. <laughs> of all the options that are out there that you could try yeah. and settling on what is this. Um, and then also, and I struggle with this in every endeavor I've ever done to try to commercialize, or monetize is to take yourself out of the equation mm -hmm. and put yourself on the other side of the camera or the other side of the of the of the bar stool and say okay I might like that but what mm -hmm. do people like you know right. what's what's the overwhelming response to what we're making yeah, and totally. that's really a part of it yeah. but boy there's so much opportunity to experiment and I'm always a little jealous of the folks <laughs> who get to just uh, sit there and play chemistry with it yeah. chemistry set with it mm -hmm. we're pretty we, I think we've set on a recipe for it though, yeah. so yeah. we're probably gonna be doing a batch of that in the next couple weeks maybe. Yeah. So I think that Apple Jill will be the first to release and then uh, Apple Jack we're actually still aging a little mm -hmm. bit longer. Yeah. So in the meantime we may release Buzz, mm -hmm. but we'll yeah. see how things play out. Yeah. So can you line a row of those shots of those out? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we can't because we're legally in the cidery. And, um, well, our, I guess we have our building divided um, into, you know, the cidery and the distillery. And when we licensed the distillery, we didn't also license a tasting room for it because we weren't sure if we wanted to also do a tasting room. Um, well, and the issue at the time, too, is they said we could do a tasting room, but we'd have to build an addition yeah, yeah. onto the distillery mm -hmm. for that so we're like well maybe we'll try to get bottles out first get some cash flow with that mm -hmm. and yeah. then if we can build some interest mm -hmm. then maybe that's something we do but it also means we have to have another person working that so mm -hmm. it could be hannah works one and i work the other mm -hmm. and we can serve that way um, but our newest idea is to divide this room uh, kind of right where that post is mm -hmm. yeah. and then that half would be uh, distillery tasting, and then this half would be the cidery tasting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you'll have to forgive me as I poke a little fun at this conversation. <laughs> but when I came here and I walked across from the cidery to the distillery, I didn't run into any walls. Yeah. So I'm curious to know who said that you, on this side of the beam, you could do this, and on that side of the beam, because we we want all the viewers and mm -hmm. all the listeners after this mm -hmm. to get out a pen and paper or their email and email someone about how ridiculous it would be that you would have to walk across the room in order to taste your distillery products that are made in a separate space, separate, <laughs> I'm doing the air quotes here, separate space on one side of your building. And then if I wanted to try the cidery, I would have to cross, maybe even walk around the outside to a separate door and come yeah. in a different entrance. That's right? true. <laughs> that, that's all, uh, 
I have some issues with some of these laws, and I think they're really antiquated. We kind of talked about it before we got started, and I think we need to change a lot of these things. And mm -hmm. um, I, that's one of the things I've always tried to do with Microshiner and with this podcast and those things is to foment interest mm -hmm. and um, mo mobilize people to go mm -hmm. make some of these changes because yeah. you guys are doing this amazing thing here. It's a benefit to the valley. It's a benefit to the economy. It's a benefit to our community. And they're putting all these... Uh, all these restrictions upon you that are making it difficult for you guys to make this business work. Totally. Right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just, as a consumer from the consumer side and then as an advocate and an enthusiast, it drives me crazy. Yeah. You know, I get really uh, angry and, and, and passionate about it. Um, so is it the state of Montana? Is it the TTB? Is it the county here in River Valley? It couldn't be those guys. <laughs> Actually, the guys in the county are really nice. Yeah. I have to say they are so like easy to work with, right. which I don't know. That's Everyone just, has been really great to work that's with. That's true, yeah. Even like the state has been awesome. It's, um, you know, everyone is just like following the rules that have been set down. In place since yeah. Prohibition. Yep. Yeah, since right. 1930 <laughs> when some mobsters wanted to corner a market. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know, actually at one point we've even tried to like say okay we can serve from this bar it's just like mondays is this you know is the cidery and tuesdays the distillery and that didn't go over well no we've <laughs> tossed around a bunch of different yeah. ideas and it yeah. is state regulation yeah yeah um and i think that well usually they'll highlight a sect if we ask them you know one of those i think it's actually i mean it's like partly state but it's also um federal because like when I was reading the laws and it's like the TTB also says, mm, um, that's, that's the, you know, t uh, tax trade bureau, yeah. um, that, uh, th your premises has to be, um, separated by a floor to ceiling wall. Mm -hmm. um, that was the TTB. Yep. No, no, no. That's, it's both in the state yeah. and the federal. Okay. Yeah. Between your production side and your tasting side. Mm -hmm. And um, between cidery and, uh, oh, and between two, cidery two, two and Two different distillery. businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. And there's like a, uh, a um, limit on how big your doors can be between businesses and stuff. And yeah, so it's, uh, it's yeah. interesting. So if we do do this, then we'd have to build, I mean, to the ceiling, mm -hmm. I think it's 20 feet. Yeah, so we'd have to build a wall mm -hmm. up to there. And then uh, if we do do this, we may do like some big sliding barn door mm -hmm. across here. Yeah. So then yeah. that's actually a separate area but then we could just keep the barn door open mm -hmm. um yeah. and you can walk between the two and you could order there and order here mm -hmm. but yeah we're still tossing uh, yeah. around that idea <laughs> rustling it, with the yeah. options and yeah, yeah. And yeah what is frustrating though is that we manufacture both products here mm -hmm. and um and in order to sell this like you know a bottle of spirits is going to be average like 30 bucks so it'd be nice to be able to taste it before you buy it yeah and that's why I think it'd be really beneficial if we can let people taste that. And right now, we can't even let people taste it in this building. Mm -hmm. So I think the only option we have is trying to work with a local bar mm -hmm. or something like that where maybe we could host tastings there. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, yeah, we're kind of toying around with some different ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people I know, uh, not to talk a whole lot of shop, but uh, for folks that are listening that want to get out and find some craft spirits, you know, if you keep tabs on, on your local distillery, or um, you'll often find they'll go to liquor stores and set up a tasting in there. And that's pretty well received, and most people are always doing that. So you can check into your local distillery or local liquor store to see if, when they're hosting a, uh, a spirits tasting from, for some yeah. small brands sometimes. Yeah. That's good stuff. What do you guys hope to accomplish with the business? Like what, you had mentioned some of your goals that you wanted to live nearby, bicycle commute. Um, do something lasting on the landscape, mm -hmm. uh, be close to the mountains for rock climbing and trail mm -hmm. running, which we got tons of around here. It's <laughs> so, <laughs> so nice. But, but any, any broader goals? I mean, what's, what, what is success for you guys? It's um, a good question. We don't, I mean, we don't have huge goals with success. We want to pay our bills yeah. basically yeah. and be yeah. to um, the whole process is, it is a craft to us. Yeah. And, um, cider is definitely, what's the phrase? Passion of hope. Labor of, what's the phrase? Labor of love. Labor of yeah, love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think both businesses are a labor of love. Mm -hmm. And we're both very artsy, crafty people. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like our artistic outlet. And um, 
yeah, if we can sell enough product to continually pay our bills and live out here and get to enjoy the mountains, and mm -hmm. we're happy with that. So that's why our, with distribution, we don't have... If we can make it in Montana, it'd be awesome. Because every time you cross the state border, there's more legality stuff you have to go through. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we're open to that idea, but um, we'll start with the state. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a state product, so hopefully, um, yeah, go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So brand building isn't a huge... Uh, I mean, as far as like, we're going to build a spirit brand, we're going to make Fire Root the next big fireball <laughs> of the liquor store world. And uh, that's kind of a thing. Uh, a lot of people get into craft spirits, and uh, we would be doing the air quotes on the craft again here with the idea that they're just going to build a brand, they're going to grow that brand, they're buying NGS, and then at some point they're going to exit out of that to Diageo and Beam, Beam Foreman or, uh, or Brown Foreman or, or Beam Suntory or somebody like that. And I just love what you guys are saying there because what, what you're describing is what I think craft is. You know, I oftentimes don't even um, use the craft term because I'm much more interested in micro businesses and independent businesses than I am in the craft businesses because that's really got sullied a little bit. Mm -hmm. I believe what you do are, is craft. I mean, the work that you were talking about going into making the coffee, vodka, and the, the back and forth and, and those types of things and how much time and energy any one of the craft distillers or cider makers puts into what they do. It's obviously a craft, but... That could be said also in a lot of ways about the Balvenie and these other people that are putting out a million cases. <laughs> but micro and independent, mm -hmm. I think, are what's the most important thing at this stage because um, at some point there may just be a need. I mean, that's where it came from. You know, alcohol, it's, it's something that doesn't get talked about, but, but alcohol was a way of preserving calories to get through to the next season, right? Mm -hmm. It really wasn't about let's make something so we can all get together and have a good time around the campfire. Yeah. Although we quickly understood that, that was <laughs> the best way to apply those calories, yeah, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, that's, that's really where the roots are is, is, is a way. And, and we forget that it's important that we have, you know, a facility like this that can make cider and brandy for the bitterroot out of apples grown in the bitterroot. You know, it, it's uh, it's what makes the world go round. And, and oftentimes that gets lost in, packaging and regulation and mm -hmm. I'm going to build a big brand and, and sell out and make a bunch of money. And, and then my question to those folks always is, okay, well, what would you do then, Hannah? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you sold out the gimbal and mm -hmm. now you got the cidery. What are you going to sell the cidery? What are you going to do next? Right. You know, uh, <laughs> totally. I don't I, really I think understand. that's what's great about spirits and cider yeah. is that, like, you know, we're, we're constantly looking to the future and trying mm -hmm. to think about our products that way and our life and, there is just endless learning. Yeah. You know, it's oh, yeah. just, we, we took a, a brand new workshop recently and I'm not sure how old the guy was that yeah, did the workshop, but six, he was an elder guy yeah. and he's still learning and he's produced brandy his entire life. He started yeah. as a teenager and just being, just seeing that in an individual and his enthusiasm. Yeah. Still. <laughs> yeah. <is> super awesome. <laughs> excited yeah. about yeah. Mm -hmm. brandy and he's only focused on brandy. Uh -huh. and just knowing with like spirits brandy is one small sector you know like mm -hmm. get into um whiskey and gin and there's so many areas that you can go to constantly learn and innovate so yeah it's something i see us doing for a long time <laughs> good good i'm especially excited about that because it's hard to get brandy. I went to the liquor store in Hamilton when I had a cold and I wanted to get some brandy mm -hmm. and I only buy craft products myself, no matter what it is. About as far out I go um, outside of craft is I mostly buy Patagonia because they're the only people that make organic. There's some new brands now, like Prana and some other people are yeah. making organic cotton clothing, but I've always just bought organic cotton clothing since I could afford to. But I went to the liquor store and I got this cold. I want to have a a hot toddy, you know, I want a, I want a, some brandy here. Mm -hmm. I go look at the shelf and there, I mean, it's Christian Brothers, it's mm -hmm. EJ Gallo. It's like, go out back and hang myself. <laughs> the best I could do was some uh, Calavados from, from yeah. France. And it was a bottle about the size of one of your, one of your ciders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was pretty expensive yeah. for that little <laughs> tiny bottle. But at least it wasn't, uh, you know, a big commodity winemaker out mm -hmm. of California that was making it. So I'm glad to see a brandy maker here in town and, and uh, or in the area. It's exciting. Yeah. 
how many more distilleries do you think the better in the greater Missoula area can take? We got an absinthe <laughs> one coming in to right. town. Yeah. I'm, I haven't been there yet. I'm super excited because yeah, absinthe is, yeah. is really <laughs> cool. And it's it's uh, my wife is always playing the Moulin Rouge, so oh, yeah. <laughs> singing in the kitchen while nice. she's making bread and things. And uh, it always makes me think of the absinthe <laughs> scenes where they get just tight on absinthe. <laughs> <laughs> things get a little crazy. But uh, you know, and there's what three three other distilleries in town, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the growth potential is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I mean, you know, we have that conversation about breweries. It's like, how many more can this area fit? And there's right. already three other ones going in, mm-hmm. and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who knows? Right. Uh, we've heard also that there's um, talk of another cidery. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, you know, the whole alcohol um, businesses, it seems like there isn't a... Uh, a roof yeah Mm -hmm. and that was actually something else we talked about is that you know in like uh, Chicago and you know some bigger cities it's become like more neighborhood places especially if you're like going off of that um, like tap room model or you know like the brew pub model Um, but yeah I don't I don't know I guess yeah as far as like how many more can we fit (laughs) there's well I mean if you look at the market as a whole and all the market that these big companies have yeah. if we slowly just start tapping into that i mean mm-hmm. the craft distillery you probably know the figures mm-hmm. yeah. of craft distilleries compared to what is it like five percent maybe it was three three percent yeah. 17 yeah. yeah actually in 16 the, but the numbers came out in 17 so it was three percent um so about 1500 just over 1500 distilleries capturing three percent of the market um so yeah, as you said, there's a ton of growth there. Yeah, if you look at it that way, I think yeah. there's there's a lot of growth, but there's a lot of people that are just going to pay the lowest amount. Yeah. For well, that's so. an interesting thing, and I I do do quite a bit of research into this. And one thing that I found was a a bit of research and a market study report that came out. It was actually a public health study that came out, and they did a a bunch of uh, surveying of people to find out what people's alcohol consumption habits were. And what it came out to be was that. Seventy-five percent of the volume of alcohol consumed in America is consumed, or yeah, is consumed by ten percent of the drinking population. Oh, hmm. whoa! So there's a huge contingent that is only buying off price point, yeah, because they can't afford to do anything else. Yeah. They'll never be able to afford to buy a bottle a day of right. craft whiskey, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, or craft brandy. Yeah. They have to buy off a of price point. And so that left about 25% of the volume sold available to you all. But that's still a huge chunk, you know, from 3% mm-hmm. to 25%. And yeah. just the question is, how do, we, how do we make it inviting? How do we make them aware of it? Mm-hmm. How do we bring them in? You know, and that's why we do this podcast is because mm-hmm. we want people to hear this, tell their friends how awesome it was and how excited they were about Fireroot Distillery and Better at Cidery and how they need to come down here and check it out. And we think that that will help grow you know, and get those folks to swing over. Yeah. And the ones that aren't contingent on price point are willing to take a chance on something and find, hey, in my backyard, I can actually go get some vodka and I don't have to buy Gordon's gin or whatever it is mm-hmm. that they typically buy. So yep. that's certainly our goal here. Yeah, yeah. we appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're doing something good at that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate what you guys got going on. Like I said, you know, the orchard itself is, is just a starting point and it's, uh, it's only going to grow and get, get bigger, so... Uh, kudos to you guys for doing this and for having me here. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Real pleasure. So cheers to you all. Cheers. cheers.